What a great group this evening. As I mentioned earlier, for those of you that are just joining us, would you please enter the student's name in the chat box so that your counselor will know that you attended this evening. We'll get started in just a moment. All right, my name is Ann Carmichael and I am with Leela, Louisiana's nonprofit resource for college planning and uh, FAFSA completion. And we're here today to talk about the college financial aid process. Um, I know that you all are college bound and great for you, but it is important to start thinking about the costs of a post-secondary education. And they're going to include your equipment, books and supplies, um, anything that you need to get you through your academic year, your personal expenses like money to pay your phone bill, do your laundry if you're living away from home, fuel for your car to go back and forth um, to campus, and then any food purchases outside of your meal plan. Then room and board, which can include your dorm room if you're living on campus or perhaps you're um, sharing an apartment with someone away from home, but off campus. And the big one, tuition and fees. Um, you're going to notice as you do your college searches that oftentimes you'll see tuition listed on a college's website. But you may always be aware that you are also going to be assessed fees such as parking, library, technology, and athletic fees. But the good news is that financial aid is available from the U.S. Department of Education, State of Louisiana in the form of the TOPS scholarship, your college or career school, and then nonprofit and private organizations like LELA. Now there are three types of federal student aid. There's free money, which includes grants and scholarships, borrowed money, which could include student loans, and earned money, such as federal work study. Types of federal student aid will include the federal Pell Grant, the Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, the Teacher Educational Assistance for College and Higher Education, or TEACH Grant, the Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grant, federal work study, and then direct subsidized, unsubsidized, and PLUS loans. The federal grant family includes Pell Grants for undergraduates with financial need, FSEOGs, which are for undergraduates with exceptional financial need, service grants for students of military parents who died defending the country following 9-11, and TEACH grants for students pursuing a teaching career. The federal work study program provides part-time jobs to help students pay for their college expenses. So when you answer yes on the FAFSA to federal work study, the financial aid office will consider you for available jobs on their campus. Your earnings from those jobs are going to be paid directly to you, the student, and should be used to pay for your college expenses. Now, I wanna let you know that these jobs look great on your first professional resume. So if you are going to a four-year college and you say work in the bursar's office or the financial aid office, that is four years of work uh, history to put on your professional resume. If you can't complete college without student loans, then they are a good investment but it's important to remember to only borrow what you need to complete your education. And it's important to understand the types of loans that you might be offered. The direct subsidized loans are based on financial need and no interest is charged 
until you graduate or cease to attend. These are known as need-based loans. On the other hand, almost everyone is eligible for direct unsubsidized loans regardless of financial need. However, the interest does begin to accrue on this type of loan once it's fully dispersed, which is usually the spring semester and then throughout the life of the loan. So you can see that there is a big difference between direct subsidized and unsubsidized loan. So when you receive your student financial aid offer, offer, you always want to accept the subsidized loan portion first. And you can remember this by telling yourself that the U in unsubsidized means that you always pay the interest on that loan. Now, if you do make the decision to accept loans, you always want to accept the federal student loans first because payments aren't due until you graduate or cease to attend. The interest rate is fixed at a lower rate and no credit check is required. This type of loan is in the student's name only. On the other hand, private loans, um, you might find that the lender will ask you to begin making payments while you're still in school. The interest rate might be variable and often it is higher and they almost always require a cosigner. So make sure that you're doing your research before selecting a private loan lender. Student financial aid can be used at four-year public and private colleges, community colleges, career and technical schools, for part-time classes, and also to take online courses. And all federal student aid and most institutional and private aid is contingent upon completion of the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA. And I'm sure you all know by now that it did launch on October 1st, and it does so every year. Remember that student financial is available on a first come first served basis. So you need to get your FAFSA submitted as soon as possible. And remember to pay close attention to your FAFSA deadlines. Your colleges will have a priority financial aid deadline. Uh, the state of Louisiana has a FAFSA deadline if you're pursuing a TOPS scholarship. And yes, the FAFSA can be used as your TOPS application. Federal Student Aid has a um, FAFSA submission deadline and check with Mrs. Jones, your counselor. She may have a deadline for you to submit your FAFSA to meet your graduation requirement. Now to be eligible for Federal Student Aid and, to, and complete a FAFSA, the student must be one of the following, a US citizen or a US national or have a green card or have an arrival departure record or a battered immigrant status or have a T visa. But let's say the parents do not. The parents of these students do not have, do not fall into any of these categories. That's fine. The dependent student can still submit a FAFSA. They will just enter zeros anywhere a parent's social security number is asked for. Now remember, only U.S. citizens with a security card can um, create an electronic signature to sign their FAFSA. All others in the other categories must print a signature page, manually sign the, the um, signature page, and mail it into federal student aid. Now you want to begin the FAFSA process by collecting all of the documents that you're going to need to complete the form. And by doing this, it should take no longer than 30 to 45 minutes to submit your FAFSA. Those documents include the student and parents social security cards because you must report your name and number exactly as printed on your most recent card. You'll need the student and parents 2020 federal income tax returns if you filed one. Now, if you don't have a copy of this return, very important that you contact your tax preparer for a duplicate copy. You're going to need it a little bit later on in the process. You'll need the student and parents W-2s because there's information on this form that might not be found 
on your federal tax return. And then gather all your bank statements and records of investments because you must report the balances of these accounts as of the date you submit the FAFSA. You'll want to begin the process by creating the Federal Student Aid ID because this is going to allow the student and his parent to identify themselves electronically when accessing the FAFSA. The FSA ID consists of a unique username and a password that you um, will create yourself by using only your personal information. Now remember that each student and one of his parents should pre provide um, information. Now, quite often, if a student or parent is having trouble uh, electronically signing the FAFSA, it's almost always because there's still information within the FSA ID itself. So remember, use your personal email address. Students, don't use your school address because you won't have access to it after you graduate. And mom or dad, use a personal email address, not your business account, because oftentimes um, communications from federal student aid will get blocked in your spam folders. All right. Um, Remember that your FSA ID is your electronic signature. It is legally binding, and you're going to need it every academic year because you'll be submitting a FAFSA every year that you're in college. So write it down and keep it in a very safe place and be sure not to share it with anyone else. Now, if you don't have access to a computer when you're ready to get started on your FAFSA, you can always download the FAFSA mobile app. It's called My Student Aid, and it's really easy to use to submit your FAFSA, either on your mobile phone or any other mobile device with internet access. Or you can always use the web-based version at fafsa.gov to submit the FAFSA. Now, if the student prefers the app and mom and dad prefer the um, mobile, uh, the web-based version, that's fine. You can work independent of each other. Uh, because all the information is going to be integrated into one form when it's time to sign and submit. When you log into your FAFSA, <clears throat> you're going to be asked to identify your role. Are you the student who wants to complete the FAFSA or are you the parent who wants to um, provide parental information in your child's FAFSA? Make sure you're identifying yourself using the username and password that you created before you began the process. Now, when you begin the FAFSA, as I mentioned, you want to make sure that you are creating the FAFSA in the student's name so students shall use your FSA ID. The parent FSA ID will be used a little bit later on in the process if you choose to transfer your information from the IRS and drop it into the FAFSA itself, and then again to sign the student's FAFSA. It's important to remember that the high school class of 2022 should complete the 2022-2023 FAFSA. You're going to have several options, but um, make sure that you are completing the correct form because you are applying for financial aid for next academic, academic year. You're going to be asked to create a save key. Now, this is a short series of letters and numbers and serves as an additional layer of secure, security. So if you begin your FAFSA and you need to stop and gather more information and you log out, You'll always be asked to provide the save key when logging back in to continue. Within the FAFSA, there are seven sections that need to be completed before submitting. And the information that you use to create that FSA ID must match exactly um, with what you're entering in the FAFSA. So if you're having trouble signing and submitting your FAFSA, 
always go back to that ID and make sure the information is correct and that it matches what is in your FAFSA itself. The different sections will include the student demographics where the student will be asked to report his social security number, uh, name printed on the social security card, date of birth, email address, home address, residency status, and gender. Next, in the school selection, you'll be asked to report the name of your high school and a list of the colleges that you want your FAFSA data to be sent to. You'll also be asked to provide your housing plans on each of those campuses. You'll move on into the dependency status section where the student will be asked to consider a list of 10 questions that will determine whether he is a dependent or an independent student for FAFSA purposes. He'll be asked to report the number of dependents living in his household and his parents' education completion level to determine whether he's a first-generation college student. You'll then move to the parent demographics where parents will report their social security numbers, their names, marital status, and the email of the person who created the FSA ID. You'll then move to the parent financials where parents will report their working wages from 2020, any federal benefits they receive, and a list of the savings and investment account balances listed on the statements that they have already gathered. Next, you'll move to the student financial section where if a student worked, he will report those wages from 2020, any federal benefits that he received, and again, a list of any savings and investment uh, balances that he might have. Now, as you move through the FAFSA, if you have a question about one of the questions, you'll notice that there's a question mark over to the right-hand side of that field. You can always click on that question mark for a more detailed information, a description of what they want uh, you to report. You can also use uh, the hyperlinks that are provided within the FAFSA. You can request a FAFSA online chat, call Federal Student Aid, or if you want to speak to me directly, call Leela's FAFSA helpline. And then you're almost finished with the FAFSA, but before you sign and submit, please review your FAFSA summary page because you're going to see a list of every question you were asked and your answer to that question. And this is the time to make those changes before you submit. You'll then move on to the sign and submit section where the student and one parent, the one that created the FSA ID, will electronically sign. Now, as I mentioned, if you cannot create an FSA ID, there is an option in this section to print, sign, and mail a, um, a wet signature to the Department of Education. Now, if there are two parents listed within your FAFSA in that parent demographic section, remember that you want to sign, parents, you want to sign as yourself. So if parent two created the FSA ID, be sure that you are providing parent two's signature. Now it's important to remember that only the colleges that you list on your FAFSA in the school selection section are going to consider you for student financial aid. So add all of the colleges that you're considering. Even if you haven't completed your admissions applications yet, go ahead and add them to your FAFSA because the financial aid office will hold on to your FAFSA data until you finish up with your admissions applications. And once you've been admitted, the financial aid office can pull down your FAFSA information and begin working on an offer for you. Now, if you're planning to apply to more than 10 colleges, there are instructions on how to do that in this section. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to call me on the FAFSA helpline um, as you go through this process. 
Now, let's talk about those uh, 10 questions that the student is going to be asked to consider um, to determine whether he is <clears throat> an independent or a dependent student. The first one is, will you be 25 or older, 24 or older by January 1st of the school year for which you're applying for financial aid? Are you married or separated, but not divorced? Will you be working on a graduate degree during the academic year in which you're applying for aid? Do you have children or other dependents other than children or a spouse who will receive more than half of their support from you? Are you currently serving on active duty in the US Armed Forces for purposes other than training? Are you a veteran of the US Armed Forces? At any time since you turned 13, were both of your parents deceased? Were you in foster care or were you a ward or a dependent of the court? Are you an emancipated minor or are you in legal guardianship as determined by a court? Now, a lot of these terms you might not be familiar with, there are hyperlinks provided. So please use that for a better understanding of these terms. Now remember that legal custody is not always considered legal guardianship. So you want to make sure that you have your documentation with you uh, while you're answering these questions. And then are you an unaccompanied youth who is homeless or are you self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? Now if your school district has identified you within one of these categories, make sure that you get a copy of that documentation uh, before you graduate because the financial aid office will ask you for it. Now, if you can answer yes to just one of those questions, you are considered an independent student and you will not be asked to report information about your parents. Everyone else must provide parental information if they want to be considered for the free money, the grants and uh, the um, subsidized student loans. So say that you live with your grandparents or other relatives or people who are not your legal guardians and they haven't legally adopted you, you cannot provide their information on your FAFSA. You must provide information about your biological parents if they are your legal parents. Now, if those um, individuals that you live with are your legal guardians, then you're an independent student and you don't have to provide parental information at all. Um, if the people that you're living with have legally adopted you, then those people should be listed on your FAFSA because they are now your legal parents. And for FAFSA purposes, you're not considered an independent student simply because you file your own taxes or you choose to live alone and support yourself. You must still provide information about your legal parents. And then the most commonly asked question that we receive is, which parent or parents should I list on my FAFSA? And the rule of thumb is that the parent or parents that you've lived with the longest in the past 12 months should be listed on your FAFSA. So if you live with both of your biological parents, that's easy, just list both of them. But if the parent you lived with the longest in the past 12 months is either separated, divorced, or was never married, then you should list that parent on your FAFSA and only that legal parent, unless that parent has remarried, and then you must include information about your step parent. Because federal student aid wants to know the financial standing of the household that the student has lived in the longest in the 12 months prior to the date that the FAFSA was submitted.
Now, if you're identified as a, a dependent student, let's say you could not answer yes to one of the prior dependency status questions, but your parents refuse to provide information on your FAFSA. You can submit that FAFSA by stating, I'm unable to provide information about my parents. However, you are only going to be offered the non-need-based federal student loan, that unsubsidized loan. So it's very important that you reach out to the financial aid offices at the colleges that you're applying to to let them know about your situation. And they will work with you to try to identify some additional aid to help you through that academic year. Now, the easiest way and quickest way to provide your um, 2020 income information in the FAFSA is to use the Internal Revenue Services Data Retrieval Tool. Now, if you filed a 2020 income tax return, it's very easy to use. And it's going to greatly diminish your chances of being selected for verification by your college financial aid office. If you do choose to use this tool, and that is your choice, um, you are going to select proceed to the IRS. Now, I just want to mention to you that although it is your option not to use this tool, colleges that receive uh, FAFSAs with manually entered income information are going to ask you to go to the IRS website, order a tax transcript from 2020, and provide it to them. So if you are um, applying to 10, 15, 20 colleges, that's 10, 15, or 20 um, transcripts you're going to be sending over. So please save yourself some time and use this tool if you can. Once you're in the IRS portal, this is when you want to grab your 2020 tax return because you must enter your name, um, street, uh, city, state, zip, exactly as it's printed on that return. If your street is abbreviated on the return, you must abbreviate it here. If your name is misspelled on your return, which we've worked with students whose preparers have uh, misspelled their names, you must um, misspell it here. Or if you've moved since the time you submitted your return for 2020. Um, if you do not have that return in front of you, you're most likely gonna have an issue using this uh, data retrieval tool. If you are not successful in transferring your information over, um, many times it's because the information that you provided in the FSA ID is not matching in your FAFSA. If you want to, um, some individual help as you go through this process, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to help you. I want to mention that once you submit your FAFSA, you're gonna automatically receive a pop-up congratulation page. And on this page, you'll find your confirmation date and time, which is important because oftentimes we'll get calls saying LSU says they didn't get my FAFSA. You can grab a copy of this um, confirmation pop-up, which we encourage you to either print or take a screenshot of. Um, you will see the next steps you need to take to complete the process. You can see all of the colleges that you have sent your FAFSA to and your expected family contribution. So make sure you're retaining a copy of this page. Once your FAFSA is fully processed, which usually takes about three to five days, it will then be shared with your colleges. At that point, the college financial aid office will begin to identify any aid that you might be eligible to receive. Now, if you want to add a school a little bit later or change your contact info, or maybe make some changes that your college requested, simply log into your FAFSA. It's the easiest way to do this. Make those changes, but remember that you always have to sign and submit your FAFSA again. 
Now, what if your family's financial situation has changed since 2020? Remember that the FAFSA is just a vehicle. It's a generic form to get your information from 2020's return over to the college financial aid offices. Um, so we encourage you to contact your college. Let the financial aid counselors know that perhaps you've had um, a loss of income, a reduction in work hours, maybe some unexpected medical expenses have been incurred by your family. The financial aid office, just the counselors, just like uh, Mrs. Jones, your high school counselor, is there to help you. So don't be shy about reaching out to them to talk to them about your situation. Because they're trying to determine your net price. And they're going to do that by subtracting any grants and scholarships that you're eligible for from your total cost of attendance on their campus. And these um, offers are going to look different on each campus. So make sure that you are applying to as many colleges as you can if price is a factor for you. The net price that's going to be determined by each college is going to be um, your responsibility to pay. You can either pay it in cash or accept student loans to pay that balance. And remember that the student is going to receive a financial aid offer from each of the schools that's listed on the FAFSA, which will include the college's cost of attendance, and then line, line item, any grants, scholarships, work study, or student loans that they have to offer you. Make sure that you're reading over these offers carefully and responding to any requests for additional information. Once you do um, determine which college you're going to accept, you want to make sure that you do accept aid in this offer, in this order scholarships and grants because this is gift aid that does not have to be repaid. Next, federal work study because you're going to earn this money and you don't have to pay it back. And then your last resort will be student loans because this is borrowed money that must be repaid with interest. Scholarships are gifts that don't have to be repaid. So I know that you've already been searching for them you can uh, find them at the colleges you're applying to, your, your um, employers, your parents' employers, private and nonprofit organizations, religious groups, just to name a few. Now, some are gonna be merit-based, awarded on your academic achievement, and others will be based on financial need. But applying for and winning these scholarships is going to reduce the cost of your education which bottom line means that it's going to reduce your student loan debt. This year, Leela will award a $1,000 FAFSA completion scholarship for seniors attending a Louisiana high school and a $1,000 Choose Louisiana scholarship for students att attending a college in the state of Louisiana. You can visit leela.org for details or contact me for the applications themselves. Now for students or parents who need additional help paying for college, after you have accepted all of your grants, scholarships, federal and state dollars, Leela does administer a nonprofit education loan program called Leela Choice. And you can find out the details at leelachoice.org. And remember, to keep receiving financial aid, you must complete a FAFSA every academic year that you're in college. So go ahead and mark your calendars for October 1st of next year when you'll be completing your FAFSA for your sophomore year. If you would like a copy of Leela's FAFSA completion guide for the class of 2022, please visit us at leela.org or email me directly and I'll be happy to send one over to you. And I want to provide you with my contact information. 
Here is our FAFSA helpline. Whether you have a general financial aid question or you want me to stay on the line with you while you complete your FAFSA, we are always here to help you. Now, if you want to schedule a, an individual FAFSA completion session, I'm going to drop the link here into the Zoom chat box. So use that link to register for a session and I will be in touch with you to get that scheduled. I wanna take the remainder of our time to be available to you to answer any FAFSA or financial aid questions that you might have. I'd love to know who has already started their FAFSA or who has already completed um, and just any Anything else that you'd like to discuss while we're here all together? You can unmute yourself or you can drop your question in the Zoom chat box. Thanks everyone who is entering your name in our chat box so that we can provide that information to your school counselor. If you do prefer to speak to me individually, please feel free to do that. But I will stay um, with you this evening for anybody who wants to chat about the situation. All right, here's a question on a parent completing the parent portion of the FAFSA. If the home situation has changed, do I have to contact each individual school to report that? The FAFSA question, and I'm assuming that you mean like the, the um, marital status. Are you talking about the marital status of the parents? If so, one of the options for reporting a change in status is, and the question reads, as of today, are the parents married, separated, divorced, never married? So if you are separated, you can state that and then each of the schools will receive information about your marital status. Now, if you're talking about your financial situation, you do have to report your earnings from 2020 and then contact each of the financial aid offices um, that your child is applying to 
and let them know about your financial situation. In that case, you do have to contact each individual school. And if you want to contact me directly and we can talk a little bit more about your situation, I'd be happy to um, entertain that. The FAFSA can be tedious. Um, some questions will ask about situations from 2020 and some questions will state as of today, as of the date that you submit the FAFSA. So just make sure as you're going through each question, you're just you know taking your time to consider each question and providing an answer. But I'd be happy to stay on, um, on the line with you as you're completing the parent section. Um, just give me a call. Yes, here's my, I'm going to give you my, um, my email address, and then if you want to call the FAFSA helpline, I'll provide that as well. And I will provide a recording of this um, presentation to Mrs. Jones um, if you would like a copy. Or you can contact me directly for one. All right, we still have several people with us. Does anyone else have specific questions? I'll give it about another minute and then we will go ahead and end the meeting. But I wanna thank you all so much for joining me and thank you, Ms. Jones, for um, inviting me to speak to your seniors and parents. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.
Okay, I'm having an individual chat with someone right now. So, um, we are pretty much finished with the meeting. And for those of you who want to work with me individually, I'm going to enter again the um, form that you can use to schedule an individual FAFSA completion session. And I just entered that in the chat box. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close out the meeting and um, just know that I'm here at any time to help you. Just give me a call. Have a nice evening.